And I do want to go ahead and get started because there is a good bit of stuff to go over today for unit eight and nine. Um, so just remember, if you are just now coming in to please join the Pear Deck at joinpd.com. Um, I've got a lot of practice questions for us, a really good practice free response question, and you're definitely going to want your notes from this session um, as it is our last one. Okay, so what I'm gonna start doing is sharing the presentation with you. So for the Pear Deck, uh, you'll have to navigate back to the window for you to put in your answers. If you wanna join the Pear Deck at any time, um, the code is in the chat. All right, so let's get started. Today, we're gonna to talk about unit eight and nine, which is all about aquatic and terrestrial pollution and global change. So this is our last one. The AP exam is right around the corner. So some goals for us today are just to review important aspects of water pollution and then toxicology. And those are really gonna be the important content from unit eight that I will cover. Now with that, most of the practice questions that I have for you today have a focus on science practices. So that means using data from charts and diagrams in order to answer questions, looking at experiments in questions and identifying aspects of those, suggesting improvements to experiments, especially with increasing validity of results, and then also posing scientific questions. So there should be a pretty healthy dose of those types on the MCQ. Now, most of the content review, though, is I want to focus on Unit 9, and that's how we mitigate global climate change and um, other types of global changes, endangered species, etc., from human impacts. The reason why I wanna focus on that today is because that could be up to 20% of exam content. And that's sort of the last unit. Y'all are just maybe finishing that up, kind of getting through that. And then of course, at the very end, as you guys requested from the last study session, I've got some FRQ tips and then a really good practice. Okay, so let's get started. Major categories of water pollutants that you may see on the exam. First, you have infectious agents that could be within drinking water, like bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and parasitic worms. Typically, the source of those water pollutants are human and animal wastes. Oxygen demanding waste, which we'll talk a little bit more in depth about later, are usually from sources that include organic waste, human sewage, feedlots, um, paper mills where you're discharging a lot of organic matter into water sources. Also, we have inorganic chemicals. That's typically from industrial practices. Maybe you've got like acid mine, um, or, uh, acid mine drainage. Uh, those are our metals, um, lead, arsenic, some salts, et cetera. Organic chemicals are gonna come from also industrial processes, runoff from farms, and just uh, runoff from things like cars, where cars leak oil, that gets into the storm sewer, and then that's discharged into rivers and streams. Plant nutrients are gonna be a huge, huge um, aspect of water pollutants. Those are our nitrates, phosphates, and ammonium. Those come from inorganic industrial fertilizers and sewage. Sediment, that's gonna come from uh, land erosion and some of those land use practices that we talked about last Saturday, like deforestation, um, uh, overuse of agricultural lands, et cetera. Sometimes we do have radioactive materials that end up in water. Typically that is from nuclear and coal power plants and nuclear weapons production. As far as the percentage of water pollution that we have, that's probably gonna be very low though. What's really gonna be a problem from things like industrial processes and nuclear power plants 
are um, heat and thermal pollution. So this is just where you have an excess amount of heat entering into streams and then you're disrupting the normal temperature, which can affect anything that is living, um, living there. So to kind of be more specific on what you've got to do on the exam with these types of water pollutants. Number one, you need to be able to isolate the human activity that's causing it. Now, some of this stuff comes in naturally. For instance, if we go back here and look at soil uh, and silt, there's always just a little bit of this running off of natural ecosystems. It only really becomes a problem, though, when you've got a huge amount of it being dumped into a water, um, a body of water. So if you look here, these are forest fires, deforestation, um, and things that disrupt that uh, those first layers of soil. Other things that are happening, um, we can uh, reduce the amount of water flow into an area by building dams and other barriers. Uh, we've got pollutants that wash into bodies of water from atmospheric transport. We talked about that in unit seven. And then you've also just got raw nutrients and sewage that come from um, our wastewater treatment, overflow of sewers, uh, nutrient runoff from agricultural practices. So that's the first thing you gotta be able to do, isolate the source, why is it coming into the water? The second thing you wanna do is be able to understand what is it doing to the actual uh, water quality. How would you be able to know if there was some type of pollutant in the water? Well, we can look at the nutrient level with a chemical test. We can look at turbidity, which is the amount of uh, uh, particles that are suspended in the water. We can look at eutrophication as a process. We talked about that previously. We can look at heavy metal contamination by also using another um, chemical test. So these are the ways that we know water pollution is happening. So number one, isolate the source. Number two, how do we identify it's actually happening and to what, uh, like what quantity is it occurring? And then the last thing you need to be able to do is discuss the ecological impact. So for instance, because of the use of inorganic fertilizers, there is an excess amount of nutrients that pollute a stream. That increases the amount of nutrients, increases eutrophication, and what this does is make ecological shifts occur, harms aquatic biota, um, de, uh, reduces the amount of oxygen, and then that affects like fish populations. So you want to take the reader or you want to be able to display that you can go from human activity what is actually happening to the water, and then what's the ecological consequence. So think about it that way when you have to like describe, discuss, um, explain those types of task verbs that you see. Okay, so I mentioned how do we use water quality data to talk about what could potentially be happening as far as water pollution? Well, this is an example. So this is a uh, chart with data on water quality for a particular stream in Illinois. And so what I want you guys to do is look on it and I want you to tell me what you think is happening at site C and at site E. Remember, be very, very specific to what particular type of water pollutant might be um, in those uh, at those sites. All right, yeah, so I'm, I'm seeing some good answers here. 
Site C, maybe there's some thermal pollution here. Okay, yeah, some yeah, some of you guys are looking at that table and you're looking at site E and there is absolutely something going on that's dropping that pH. So something about acids, absolutely. Okay, so let's take site C first and look at how it is different from the rest of the data points for this stream. So let's look at um, C as it compares with water temperature. Now it is a little bit higher than most of the other sites. The, other, the only other place that has a higher water temperature is site A, but we can see why. Look at the forest canopy. It's a lot less shaded. That means that the parts of the stream are more exposed to sunlight, and so it should be a little bit warmer. But what's weird about C is that the canopy cover is pretty similar to B, D, and E. So why the higher water temperature? Well, now we got to shift over to another column to see why. Well, I'm looking here at turbidity, right? Look at the turbidity in site C. It is super, super high, way higher than anything else, as well as the dissolved solids. Now the pH is neutral and the hardness looks like it's pretty normal, typical. So it must be that there is higher temperature here because of something that's happening with the dissolved solids. So I want you to remember that when you increase the turbidity, you also increase the absorption of light and that increases heat. Now, what could be happening here to increase turbidity? Something is increasing the amount of uh, sediment that is flowing into this place. So that could be agricultural area. That could be somebody's talking about maybe dumping from factories. Um, that could be, you know, just dumping sediment. Maybe there was some deforestation near this area and a lot of that soil is just washing into the water. All right, so that is site C. Now we got to look at E. That's a little bit different. It's not temperature. It's not anything to do with the forest canopy. Um, the turbidity is a little high, but it's not as high as definitely C. But what, you're, what you have here is a difference in these two rows. The pH is really, really low. So that means that you have a higher um, amount of acids that are, that are at this point in the stream. Now, why? Hardness right here. So this is the amount of metals and other solutes that could be in the stream here. So I think you guys are absolutely true. There's something going on here with acid, but it's because there are metals being dumped into the river at this point. Now that could be from industrial um, issues. That could be like acid mine, uh, mine drainage, something to that effect. So guys, I hope you kind of see what's going on here with, with this type of question. You wanna look at all of the data as it compares to everything else. All right, so moving along here, let's try a multiple choice question. So cholera is an acute infection of the digestive system. It's caused by Vibrio cholerae. Infected individuals can experience a range of symptoms. Um, if symptoms persist and severe dehydration results, an infected individual can die within hours of symptom onset. So the diagram below shows how cholera is transmitted. So based on this diagram, which of the following is the most likely reason that a community with good sanitation could still have individuals who contract, uh, who contract cholera? Okay. 
All right, so it's looking like most of us are thinking either B, C, or D. Okay, so let's take a look at those answers first. So B. cholerae grow rapidly in clear moving water that has limited nutrients or wastes. So let's kind of look at the diagram to see, is that true? All right, so two here, pollutants offer nutrients like nitrogen phosphate, phosphate and that increases algal growth, which then increases the amount of that bacteria. So I don't know if that's necessarily true because it really thrives when there's lots of nutrients or wastes. Okay, so C, wastewater treatment facilities use high levels of chlorine to treat the outgoing municipal water supply and have an increased risk of cholera outbreaks. Well, typically if you're using a lot of chlorine to treat um, water supply, that's probably gonna kill your bacteria. However, if you do have runoff from a nearby agricultural field, then that could possibly still increase cholera. So, so it can be not anything to do with good sanitation practices. It could just happen uh, because of other sources of that pollutant. So if you said, if you said D, that is correct. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we were gonna talk a little bit more about oxygen demanding wastes and dissolved oxygen. At some point, I'm almost positive that you're gonna see a graph like this. There probably won't be as much information here, but there will be something where you have to look at an oxygen sag curve as it relates to uh, water pollution coming from a point source, okay? so. Let's just kind of go through this, make sure we know what's really going on here. So here is the part of the uh, stream at which, at which waste or maybe even thermal pollution is occurring. So you can see that water is flowing this way, so it's going to push all of the pollutants downstream. Now, as it sort of moves, you can see that the pollutants become less and less concentrated, more dispersed. So typically what we see is the acute effects of the pollution being right after it is discharged. So how do we know that this is happening without doing some type of chemical assessment? Well, we can actually look at the biodiversity of a stream and determine what could uh, potentially be going on here. So before you have um, any of this pollutant, you've got a high amount of dissolved oxygen, eight parts per million. You've got clean water, a lot of biodiversity, large fish, um, and the you know amount of the uh, waste or heat, there's nothing here at all. Now, if you look at the decomposition zone, what's happening to our oxygen? Well, it was really high up here. Now it's starting to plummet. And that's because you've got this high level of pollutants here that is causing these decomposers to increase in their population and utilize all of that dissolved oxygen. Well, some organisms can still live at those low oxygen environments, things like tarp, uh, or sorry, carp, leeches, things like that. Now, where you have the worst effects is a little bit downstream where you can see that the pollutant is still concentrated, but very widely dispersed. So here you've got really low dissolved oxygen and practically no fish. This is the septic zone. This is where you've got mostly anaerobic organisms or very um, low oxygen demanding species. Now, after you have a more dispersed, less concentrated amount, you can start to see that there is some recovery going on here. Uh, dissolved oxygen starts to creep back up because the amount of pollutants is still decreasing. And then finally, very, very like downstream from the point source, you've got another clean zone and we're back at a healthy level of dissolved oxygen. So please make sure that you are uh, looking back on what is an oxygen sag curve, what does it tell me about the ecosystem, and what type of biodiversity should I be able to find in each of these different zones. All right, so speaking of dissolved oxygen, I've got another chart of data. So in a laboratory experiment uh, that was done that shows the effects of organic waste 
on dissolved oxygen content in water. So five tanks were set up, each containing fresh water and a small amount of a single-celled green al algae. Specified amounts of organic waste were added to the tanks. So the results below show the amount of dissolved oxygen in each tank after a period of one week. So the question is, why did the dissolved oxygen after one week decrease as the amount of waste increased? All right, so it looks like we definitely don't think it's A or E. So let's look at B, C, and D. So the question, why did the dissolved oxygen after one week decreases the amount of waste increased? So B, the turbidity of the water increased and the algae population increased. Well, we don't actually have any um, turbidity, uh, you know, sort of, data there. So we're not really sure. Probably it did because you're adding in organic waste here. Um, but we're also not really worried about algae population. We, we want to know why, why is the dissolved oxygen decreasing? And honestly, if you have more photosynthetic uh, organisms in the water and they're doing more photosynthesis, we really should see an increase in dissolved oxygen. So that doesn't quite answer it as well. Okay, so the algae multiplied probably going to happen because you're adding in nutrients, then died, then decomposed. Okay, so this is important. Decomposition, that's basically going to um, increase the amount of cellular respiration. And when you do that, that decreases dissolved oxygen because you need oxygen in order to decompose those um, dead algae uh, cells. But let's check for D. Okay, so the D CO2 increased due to algal respiration. Well, remember photosynthetic um, organisms, producer, you know, they're, they're sort of like making oxygen at the same time as, as they are utilizing oxygen because they're photosynthesizing as well as um, increasing, uh, you know, cellular respiration. So really the most, uh, or the best answer here as to why dissolved oxygen decreased as the amount of waste increased is because of the multiplied algae, they couldn't be sustained, so then they died and then decomposed. Remember guys, this is called eutrophication. So please, please, please make sure, kind of go back and um, study that before the test there. Okay, same, same chart, new question. So here, which of the following would best improve the validity of the experiment? So this is one of those science practices questions. All right, so it looks like we're settling on C, which is excellent. Um, repetition, uh, redoing the experiment, multiple trials, all of those always increase the validity of the experiment. Uh, we definitely would not want to eliminate take one. Take one is actually our control. And any good experiment has some type of control. Um, so yeah, excellent job, guys. Uh, C was the right answer, repeating the experiment several times. 
Okay, so one of the things that we can do to prevent things like eutrophication from occurring or human health from being affected by the introduction of bacteria and viruses into our water supply is by treating sewage. So our wastewater that comes from our homes, from dishwashers, you know, uh, washing machines, our showers, our toilets, all of those go either to a septic tank or a sewage treatment plant, or at least it should. So what you will need to know about this are the three uh, steps of sewage treatment and what each of those does in order to uh, reduce the amount of these contaminants in our water. So primary sewage treatment is definitely a physical process. This is gonna be screening out really big, large objects. Uh, usually you're using sand or rock to help, uh, or you're using some type of um, filter system and it kind of like settles down to the bottom. Those are then kind of scooped out as sludge and those have to be uh, disposed of properly. This gets about 60% of our suspended solids and about 30 to 40% of the uh, oxygen demanding organic waste. So primary treatment, getting the big stuff. Now secondary treatment, this is a biological process and this is also what occurs in septic tanks. You've got bacteria that are going to break down a lot of the biodegradable waste, like the majority of it. Now the only bad thing about secondary sewage treatment is although it really uh, reduces the amount of oxygen demanding waste, things that are organic substances like pesticides or pharmaceuticals, so like if you've ever heard of people taking old medicine and then just flushing it down the toilet, those things do not get filtered out from secondary sewage treatment. If you want to get things like that out, you've got to do advanced treatment. And unfortunately, a lot of sewage treatment plants are not currently equipped with a tertiary or advanced treatment system. So those are special chemical and physical processes using very, you know, um, like sophisticated filters to get things out like nitrogen, phosphorus. The reason why it's not widely used is because it costs a lot of money to put in an additional level of sewage treatment. Now, lastly, what we, what we usually do is bleach the water before we discharge it back into the environment. We usually do this with chlorine. Now, although this disinfects, makes the water look very clean, it also can have some um, negative consequences. As we'll talk about later, chlorine really likes to combine with other stuff in the environment and create its own pollutants. So just to kind of look at this from a diagram perspective, First part here is incoming raw sewage. This is coming from um, our sewer system. Like I said, wastewater coming from houses. Here, there's a screen to get out really, really large objects that goes into a settling tank where the big suspended particles can like um, uh, fall down. Sometimes they will add like flocculent that kind of gets those small particles to clump together, makes them heavy, and then they settle down. That then can go into a sludge digester and then finally get dried out and be disposed of, um, hopefully appropriately in some type of landfill. Now, secondly, you go to an aeration tank in secondary sewage treatment that gets oxygen going, kind of like reactivates whatever's in there. That goes to another settling tank once it's been decomposed by um, our aerobic uh, decomposers. And then again, you've got chlorine disinfection, which kills bacteria, and then that's discharged back into the ecosystem. Again, what we're not filtering out here are um, uh, pharmaceutical uh, stuff right here, like medicines, um, doesn't get rid of just pure nitrogen or phosphorus or anything like that, unless you've got a really nice tertiary system. Okay, so let's look at another question that's got some uh, data from a diagram. Researchers are evaluating the waste treatment facility located on the Moose River in the northeastern United States. They are sampling the river and its tributaries at several locations as shown on the map below. So water from which of the following locations on the map would best serve as a control group for the study?
All right, so most of you guys are thinking it's gonna be A. So again, water is flowing this way. So this is kind of what, what we looked at with that oxygen sag curve. We wanna know what the effect of discharge from this waste treatment facility is going to do after it's there in the water. So what we need is a point at which we know there's likely no uh, discharge into that portion of the stream. And since stream flow is going this way, A would be a really good candidate for the control group. So if you said A, you were correct. So what do we do with just the water that is coming off of our streets, um, especially when you've got uh, precipitation or you know water just draining off of roads? So some cities have two different networks of pipe. So you've got the storm runoff from the streets. It kind of goes out and does its own, own thing. And then you have one for uh, sewage. So it kind of separates out and makes sure that sewer uh, water or wastewater from houses are going and getting treated. But there are a lot of cities in our country that have a combined system. The reason why this is, is because it's cheaper. But the problem is, if you've got a large amount of storms or precipitation at any one time, those can overwhelm our combined sewer system and causes overflows. So what happens when you get some type of overflow? So the next question for you guys. What are some water pollution concerns for this type of sewer system? All right, remember, we want to try to be as specific as possible as to one of the types of water pollution. So kind of remember what I showed you guys in that first slide. Is it, you know, metals? Are we worried about inorganic metals? Or are we worried about organic waste? Are we worried about, you know, try to be as specific as possible. All right, yeah, that sounds really great, guys. So some of the stuff y'all are talking about is an overflow of organic wastes. And we wanna be really um, specific here as to what the problem would be. So if you've got you know, uh, human waste basically running off into our streams untreated, there's gonna be excesses of nitrogen, phosphorus. The other thing that can happen is that you've got um, bacteria, and viruses that are present in human waste that then just goes straight into the stream without being treated here. So what you really wanna look at is if I'm not going through wastewater treatment, what are some of the contaminants in our um, sewage that could end up in some of these streams? So just remember real, real, real specific here. Okay, so let's move on to sort of our last thing we'll talk about with unit eight, and that is toxicology. So maybe you guys did some type of experiment with this, or you looked at some data um, as far as what are some of the effects of chemicals and their dosage on human health. So how do we know whether or not a chemical is harmful or it's toxic or, or, or bad for us? Well, we usually do some type of uh, toxicology study to measure the toxicity of it. That's a measure of how harmful a substance is 
but at what dose? So one of the first things you have to remember is how is it getting into the body? Is it a chemical that can be inhaled? Does it have to be injected into the bloodstream? Is it something that can be absorbed from our skin, from just exposure to it? Or is it something that we could ingest either in our food or our drinking water that can then be absorbed into our body via the digestive system? So that's the first thing that we think about with toxicology. How, do, how are we exposed? Then we want to look at the dosage over a period of time. So I'm sure that you guys um, have heard this little saying, the dosage makes the poison. So technically, water can even be harmful to us in high enough dosages. So it's not just that, you know, it causes the harm. You have to actually have the risk of exposure in the environment, in your home, etc. So we wanna know who's being exposed, how often does the exposure occur, and then how well does the body already detoxify that particular chemical? So if our liver, kidneys, other kinds of systems can very easily rid our bodies of the, tox of the toxic substance, it's, it, maybe we need a, a much higher dose of it for it to be a problem. Um, we also need to look at the sensitivity of a particular pop, uh, population. So we talked about this a little bit in the first few units where we know a population of organisms are all genetically diverse. That means that, that you're gonna have some that are very uh, sort of like hardy against particular environmental variables and then those that are very sensitive to it. So that's the same thing when it comes to dealing with chemicals. The last things that we want to look at if uh, we're looking at the risk of a particular chemical is how soluble is it? So does it easily enter into our water supply? Is it water soluble? And then once it's there, how long does it last? So if it only is there for 20 minutes and then it decomposes, that's probably not going to be as risky as a chemical that could potentially stick around for weeks, months, or even years. So the other thing that you've got to remember about chemicals and their persistence and whether or not they can cause harm are two favorite little words that are easily confused, which are bioaccumulation and then biomagnification. So bioaccumulation, that is just where you have an increasing concentration of a particular chemical or something that is going to uh, be sequestered in organs and tissues higher than it should be. So typically water soluble um, toxic chemicals can be excreted in urine. It's really the fat soluble or, or the oil soluble toxins that we're um, concerned with remaining in body tissues for a really, really long time. Now that's the accumulation part. Then what are we doing with the magnification? Well, if it's being kind of stored in our bodily tissues and then those organisms are being eaten, that is passing up the food chain and becoming magnified. Now, two particular chemicals that you need to know that this happens with is DDT and PC, PCBs. Now, DDT, I'm sure you guys know what that is. That was the, you know, sort of like pesticide or that we're trying to get rid of mosquitoes and they used to spray it. But let's talk a little bit more about PCBs. Those are stored in body fat very, very easily. They're oily liquids and solids very stable in the environment. They used to be widely used in like electrical equipment, um, lubricants, hydraulic fluid, all kinds of stuff. Now, luckily the commercial production of this ended in the seventies when a lot of our other environmental legislation was happening and it was completely banned in 1979 by the EPA. So right now we're not currently manufacturing and using PCBs, but for a long time, they were already present in our environment. So typically what we see as exposure risk are spills, leaks from improper storage and disposal. So just to kind of remind you guys of what this looks like, when you have say DET or this even um, is for PCBs, maybe it's a very, very small amount that gets into our water. But if it is a being absorbed here by the bottom of the food chain and then it's being eaten it gets more and more concentrated, more and more concentrated until finally it starts affecting us let that eat a lot of this stuff or other predators that are higher on the food chain. All right, so let's look at our next multiple choice practice question. 
So mercury concentrations were measured in freshwater shrimp populations in two different ponds, one polluted with mercury and one unpolluted with a similar food web in each pond. Which of the following best identifies the scientific question that would guide this investigation? All right, so it looks like we're settling on C. So let's kind of look back at what we're given in the question and make sure that we're getting this idea of like a scientific question that could actually be applicable to this investigation. Now, what do we know about our variables? Well, we're measuring freshwater shrimp populations and their mercury concentration. So, you know, this is our dependent variable. Well, what are we doing to see what affects this? Well, we're looking at one polluted with mercury and then one that's unpolluted. So the pollution is our independent variable here and we're comparing it to an unpolluted control. Now, if we're looking at a scientific question, basically like a hypothesis here, it's gotta involve both our dependent variable and our independent variable. And you guys are right. Um, if you're looking at uh, how much mercury accumulates in the tissues of shrimp living in a polluted pond, absolutely applicable to this investigation. So, like I said, what we're looking at for determining whether or not something poses a threat to human health, then we're gonna call it a poison or a toxin. We've gotta look at what it actually does to a population of organisms, because like I said, every individual is genetically diverse. So how do we experimentally determine the toxicity level of a chemical in the lab? Well, one, we're gonna look at something called LD50, or you could have um, heard of LC50. LD50 is lethal dose, LC is lethal concentration. So dose would be like, I'm giving it to you in a medication or I'm injecting it. Concentration would be, you're a fish in a tank and then I'm pouring some kind of chemical in your environment. Or for us, it's in the air that we're breathing, something to that effect. Now, chemical with an LD50 of 50 milligrams or less per kilogram of body weight. And what we're looking at here is the median lethal dose. Why 50? Why is that an important number? Well, that is the amount of chemical in one dose that would kill 50% of our test population within a two week time span. So that means that you could have a chemical here that um, at a dose below that LD50, it only maybe affects 25%. We wouldn't then say that's the lethal dose. L L LD50 or LC50 is kind of our little magical cutoff there. So on almost pod, like I'm pretty sure, just like I am with the oxygen sag curve, you are going to see this dose response curve. So what you'll see is some percentage of the population that either survives or is killed by a given dose. So that ranges from zero to 100. Then you're gonna see on the x-axis, the dose in some type of unit, micrograms, you know, milligrams, kilograms, whatever it is. What you're gonna to wanna to do is be able to isolate on that curve what dose uh, corresponds to this right here, this 50% mark. So let's kind of take a look at a, an example here with LD50. So this was one example of a question on a practice test that shows you LD50 for two different species of mice after being exposed to a mutagen for 30 days. And you had to be able to calculate the difference in LD50 for the two different species of mice.
All right. I'll give you guys kind of a little hint here. So remember, when we're looking at LD50, we're looking at that this 50% mark dying within 30 days, 50% are there um, of them have uh, been affected. So if I draw the line over to where it hits the dose response curve for species one, this is where it intercepts. So now I can find the corresponding dosage by looking at my X axis. So I know that 500, that's the number here, 500 milligrams are the LD50 for species one. Now this is a little different though for species two. So if I keep extending the line over, it intercepts here. And then when I draw that down to the X axis, maybe that's 575, maybe 580, right? Kind of a range there because it is a graph that we're reading from. So now we need to calculate the difference between those two LD50s. All right, yeah, that's looking great, guys. So if we said, you know, maybe 575, you know, subtract 500 from that, that's about 75 milligrams, could be 80, you know, depending on what you what you were kind of reading here um, on, on the graph. There's usually a range on the test if you do have to sort of look uh, at, at this scale that you don't know for sure what the number is. Okay, so we talked about LD50, but there is another um, there is another term that's associated with dose response curves, and that's called threshold. So LD50, say this is like the 50% here, you know, that would be like where these curves are um, right here, affecting 50% of the population uh, within a given time period, or is lethal to 50% of the population. Threshold though is different. That's where you are beginning to detect uh, a change in the population at all. So if you look at these two curves, this one right here, there is no threshold. You start to see a response immediately when the organisms have been exposed to the chemical. But in this curve, there is a point where you're increasing the dose, but there isn't a response yet. So threshold is where you first start to see um, a little bit of effect of that chemical on the population. All right, so speaking of LD50, let's do a little bit of math practice here. The LD50 for arsenic in humans is 13 milligrams per kilogram. Which of the following approaches should be used to calculate the number of grams of arsenic it would take to reach the LD50 in a 140 pound person? So one kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. All right, this is looking good, guys. So y'all are thinking it's definitely B, so let's confirm. What do we know from the problem? Well, we're starting with the 140 pounds that the person is. So there it is right there, 140. We also want to then convert pounds to kilograms because kilograms are what we have as far as our LD50. So there's the conversion factor right there. So we know it's uh, 13 milligrams per kilogram, that's the LD50. And then again, we've got to um, be able to determine what the number of grams, right? So that's the important part here. We, our answer has to end in grams. So when we look at this, 
the pounds cancel out, the kilograms cancel out, and so do the milligrams, and we should be left with how many grams it would take. So if you said B, you were correct, which everybody did. All right, another LD50. So the graph below depicts the dose response curves for three common bacteria and then a newly discovered bacterium in streams near agricultural properties. An individual is exposed to the water in the stream from which the sample show in the graph was taken. If the individual is exposed to the highest dose of the bacteria, which of the following bacteria would have the lowest probability of causing illness if ingested? Oh, I'm sorry, I need to advance the Pear Deck for you guys. I apologize. All right, so we're kind of split 50-50. Um, either we're thinking it's A or B, okay? All right, so let's kind of look at what we've got as far as our curves. So for salmonella, um, if, we, if we're looking at the, the highest dose, right? If the individual was exposed to the highest dose, then that is a, that is a big problem for pretty much salmonella and E. coli. That, that's probably going to be 100% of people are going to get sick. Now, with the newly discovered, right, again, here's the highest dose. That's pretty much at that LD50. That's our cutoff. That's where we're going to think that's, got a, that's a toxic dosage, right, a lethal dose. So really the only one that isn't like that, that doesn't get up to that uh, sort of cutoff, is this guy right here, C. jejuni. And so that is, that is A. All right, guys, so we are leaving unit eight behind and we are going into unit nine. So remember, this is kind of gonna be more the bulk of what we're gonna talk about. Here's what we need to know from unit nine, just as a kind of study guide. Number one, you've gotta know what stratospheric ozone depletion is. And then what is the major way that we have reduced it? You've got to be able to understand the greenhouse effect. I'm gonna show you some diagrams that should help. You've gotta be able to identify the greenhouse gases and then what human processes increase them. What is global climate change? What is the scientific data that lets us know it's occurring? Effects of both ocean warming and ocean acidification. Why are invasive species a problem to biodiversity? What causes some species to become endangered versus others? What are we doing to protect them? And then this nice little acro acronym right here, you also could have um, uh, been shown this, HIPCO or HIPOC, HIPPO plus C, whatever you need to do to be able to remember that. So we'll get into that um, here shortly. First, let's talk about that stratospheric ozone problem. So remember when we talked about um, uh, different things in the atmospheric pollution unit, unit seven, we talked about tropospheric ozone, right? The bad ozone. We don't want ozone here, but there is a layer that we do want ozone in and that's stratospheric ozone. That's our protective layer that keeps about 95% of the harmful UV radiation from e reaching our surface and damaging our skin, damaging plants and damaging other organisms. Now, one of the um, uh, biggest causes of ozone depletion that 
you know, was man-made here is the development and use of CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons, specifically these guys right here. And you've probably heard this before, Freons, that's uh, CCL2, F2, it's got fluorine in it. The reason why we use these is because they were chemically stable, odorless, they're non-toxic, they don't hurt anything, and they're really non-corrosive. So, so they were used often to, uh, as coolants and like air conditioning units, cleaners, fumigants, even blowing bubbles in little plastic foam. We used it all over the place. And so between 1960 and 1990, we just were making these things left and right. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that when you release CFCs, so let's say this molecule right here, we've got fluorine, chlorine, or sorry, a carbon, and then these three chlorine atoms here. Well, those rise up from the troposphere to the stratosphere where it starts to interact with uh, the good ozone. So UV radiation, remember, is really high at that high level, and that causes one of these chlorine atoms to break away. Now, if you're looking at your periodic table or if you remember from chemistry, chlorine is extremely reactive, even more reactive than oxygen, right? So chlorine can interact with ozone, O3, and pull one of these oxygens away. Well, now you've just got, you know, diatomic oxygen, which is fine, but it doesn't have the same chemical properties as it does when there's three of them, meaning it can't protect us from UV radiation. Now, this is bad enough. But what happens is then a free oxygen molecule can hit this molecule that was just created and release that free chlorine again. And then it can just go back and continue to degrade molecules of ozone over and over and over again. So it's not just, you know, one CFC molecule degrades one ozone molecule. It's a chain reaction that continues to occur. So what is sort of the, the good news here? Well, um, a guy, or a guy, a scientist, a, a, chemi a chemical scientist named F. Sherwood Rowland did several series of experiments that determined that it was indeed CFCs that were causing stratospheric ozone depletion. And so in the 1970s, again, when a lot of this other environmental legislation started be to become popularized, um, that is when people started thinking about what do we need to do, what can we do to reduce our CFC production and use so that our ozone layer can recover. Because it is, it can recover. Ozone can, you know, is steadily being created. Um, so if we can just stop producing CFCs, then it will have time to rebuild itself. So what we have from that is the Montreal Protocol. Now this is required legislation, guys, so you definitely got to know this. Um, this was a global agreement to protect the ozone layer by phasing out the production of ODS or ozone depleting substances. This is really important and sort of a monumental thing that we were able to do because it pretty much received universal ratification by all countries. And over its history, it's pretty much been supported by everybody. Uh, U.S. industry companies, environmental advocates, you know, everybody's adopting this. We stopped making CFCs. So the good news here, we didn't have a lot of ozone. This was 1979, but you can see that as we've reduced our ODS and we have a, you know, moratorium on their creation, the ozone layer is recovering and we don't have ox uh, ozone depletion as badly. All right, so the next thing here is greenhouse, the greenhouse effect, and this can kind of throw us for a little bit of a loop, so I want to make sure um, that we uh, kind of go through this, understand what's really, really happening here. So the greenhouse effect is much like the glass of a greenhouse that allows light to come in, but like, you know, you want your vegetables or your flowers to be warm during the winter, well, then it traps in heat and still allows for the plants to photosynthesize. Well, that's what's happening with the greenhouse effect, but instead of it being glass, it's these greenhouse gases. So as sunlight penetrates our atmosphere, it warms the surface of the earth, right? So um, as the energy is absorbed by surfaces, it heat re-radiates out or infrared radiation heat. Um, it, it, radiates back up. Now, some of this stuff is going to escape into space, but depending on the concentration of greenhouse gases, 
a lot of those can then just be absorbed and then redirected downwards. So if you've got, say, methane, you know, we'll talk about CO2, et cetera, those trap the heat and then it re-radiates down. So whereas it used to just kind of go out into space, it can build up and then that starts to change our surface temperatures. All right, before we go, uh, go on a little bit of a break here, um, let's look at this one, one problem here. This was a diagram that was on a recent test um, showing incoming solar energy and then the effect of greenhouse gases on it. So I want you guys to try to calculate the percentage of incoming solar energy that is not contributing to the greenhouse effect. All right, so I'm seeing kind of uh, between 25, 35%. So let's look at what it is here. 30%, okay, so how did I come up with 30% that is not, remember, not contributing to the greenhouse effect? All right, so let's look at it. We've got 100 units of solar energy that is coming in, okay? 50% is absorbed by the surface which then is gonna be part of this re-radiated IR radiation here. 20% of it is being absorbed by the clouds, which again is going to radiate back out. Some of it's gonna go here, some of it's gonna to go to space. Um, so what incoming amount of solar energy has nothing to do out of this 100, nothing to do with it? Well, 5% is directly reflected by the surface and 25% is directly reflected to the clouds. It in no way is being absorbed. So that's where we're getting the 35%. 25 plus five out of 100, that gets us 30% of that incoming energy not contributing in any way to the greenhouse effect. All right, so let's take a small break here for a little bit, um, about about five minutes. So let's come back at 3.07. So take a water break, bathroom break, and I'll see you guys at 3.07.
All right, it's 307, so let's get started. So that was a graph that showed you the effect of the greenhouse gases, but you've got to be able to identify some as well. So these are the most potent greenhouse gases um, that are emitted by human activities. So methane, CFCs, ozone, nitrous oxide, and then carbon dioxide. Now this pie chart here does not show us the abundance um, of the greenhouse gases on our atmosphere. This is showing the importance when it comes to climate change and the greenhouse effect. So up to 50% of what we see happening in our atmosphere as far as like the trapping of the heat is due to carbon dioxide. Now, if you wanted to then reduce our, um, uh, or reduce the effects of greenhouse gases, and we're looking at this pie chart, really what should be our target as far as uh, interventions? Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm hearing some good stuff. Maybe we need to start introducing some type of legislation or regulation that probably targets CO2, right? It's, it's up to 50% of our problem. Another good target may be methane since it's 18% and maybe we're, we're starting to produce more methane because of using uh, natural gas or agricultural practices like um, uh, raising cows for meat. So just looking at the data here, if we wanted to really just have the biggest bang for our buck here, these two are probably best on our list to, to make those legislation and laws for. Okay, so why do we even care about the greenhouse effect? What does this do as far as global change? Because remember, that's the name of the unit. Well, it's really about changing the Earth's climate. And this is not a new concept, nor is it the first time to have happened in the history of the Earth. Earth historically kind of goes through alternating periods of global warming, global cooling. Sometimes this happens very slowly, but sometimes it's very rapid, like it is now. So cold periods we usually call glacial periods. So here you can see the extent of glaciers even down into uh, the United States. And then we are in warm periods, so interglacial periods. Technically right now, we're in an interglacial period. So over the past, we'll see 160,000 years. So we've got the Pleistocene and then here at the current present um, in the Holocene, you can see that there's been some pretty uh, major shifts in temperature. So here is an interglacial period. And then again, like I said, the present interglacial. So we're really not talking about um, the earth has just been steadily warming or steadily cooling, there's always kind of a fluctuation. So then why is kind of why is there a big deal then? Well, again, how fast is it occurring? And do we really want the temperatures to be shifting as quickly as they are? Now around 1860, that's when we start to get some pretty accurate thermometer readings available worldwide. So if we look at the annual averages for the entire world, and then we compare it to the current, the largest rise is projected to happen now. So here you can see that generally the temperature anomalies were cooler than that, that average. Here, they're warmer and they are only getting more and more extreme. Now, if you look at the scale, we're only talking about maybe half a degree, a little bit warmer Celsius. Well, okay, that's not that big a deal. But remember, we're talking about averages. So this is even considering places that are experiencing extremely large temperature shifts. Okay. How do we know this? So what do we what do we use as far as evidence to know that the earth is actually warming, okay? Well, number one, we're looking at uh, taking cores from different places. So drill holes uh, or drill holes and we get ice cores taken from old glaciers in places like Greenland, Antarctica, 
Then we can take out the gases that are trapped in that ice, analyze it, and know how much CO2, how much methane, whatever, was historically within the atmosphere. That's how we know, okay, it is on the rise or it is on the decrease, et cetera. We also can look at cores from the bottom of lakes, swamps, and ponds. Now, after you look at all the data from what we know about historic temperatures or where glaciers were, then versus the amount of atmospheric CO2 or methane, et cetera, then we can come up with a consensus as to what trends actually influence climate change. Um, this is not just like one or two folks, right? This is a consensus reached by over 2,000 climate experts around the world that make up a um, certain organization called the IPCC or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We also currently uh, monitor temperature um, using like ocean buoys and other type of atmospheric uh, measurements. That's something that we talked about with like El Nino. That's how we know uh, when the when the ocean is warmer or when it's cooler. Now, why do we care about the earth getting a little bit warmer? Well, one of the things that a warmer climate tends to do is raise sea level. And you may think, ah, it's because melting ice and ice causes the volume of the oceans to increase. And that's what does it. But if we look at what's actually happening with sea level rise, there is some you know, contribute, contributing factor here, melting of the Greenland ice sheet, melting of alpine glaciers, but one of the biggest, almost 57% of the sea rise, will, uh, sea rise that we'll see actually is um, due to something called thermal expansion. And that just is because as water heats up, it expands. That's just what we know from taking like physics and chemistry. So if you are heating up the oceans, if the oceans are continually absorbing more heat, then the water expands and then the oceans themselves expand. Now, the important thing is not necessarily for us. I mean, we're, we're pretty far in, but what does this mean for coastal and island populations? And if you remember, we talked about the fact that most of Earth's population is based around water and particularly the coasts. So if you are in New York, Charleston, you know, Orlando, Houston, all these other places, and we have thermal expansion, ice sheet melting, those are going to be the places that are first affected. So the bulk of our population is coastal. And then again, these island nations like here, where you've got settlements, I mean, only just a little tiny bit of sea rise can cause extreme flooding, especially when it comes to storm surge. Okay, so one of the things is just sea level rise, but there's also some other effects on the ways that our oceans work. Um, and that is the uh, affecting global precipitation patterns that alter the distribution, um, severity and frequency of things like droughts, floods and storms. And that's because it affects the way that water vapor is moving in the air because of uh, weather currents and ocean currents. So if you have a lot of sea ice melt from the poles melting into the warmer, saltier water of the ocean, that could potentially disrupt some of the current flow that we have already. And one major concern is the Gulf Stream. So this is sort of what Europe looks like when you're in a glacial period. And if you look at latitude, right? So here's, you know, here's England, you just draw kind of a line. I mean, that's at the same latitudes as some pretty cool places in North America. Well, the reason why it's got a climate that's very similar to ours is because the Gulf Stream kind of takes warm air, warm water from the equator and pulls it up and it kind of like washes over Europe. Well, if we've got a disruption of these currents, it could potentially slow it down and then you're no longer drawing as much warm air or warm water up to the, the those areas. Another issue that is in, tied in with this is um, a positive feedback loop. So let's kind of go back to what's happening with the oceans as far as their ability to absorb energy in the first place. Last week I mentioned albedo. That's a degree of reflectiveness or a degree of how much energy can be absorbed by a surface and it's dependent on pigment or color. So a surface with a value of zero would absorb 
all of the light that hits it, a surface with a value of one would reflect all you know, energy that hits it. So when we look at different surfaces on earth, open ocean, right? absorbs most of the energy that is hitting it. So all of this uh, uh, light energy coming from the sun, it's really not being reflected back out. It's being absorbed. If you've got ice, bare ice, then it absorbs less and reflects more. And again, ice covered with snow like we have on our glaciers, those are really great reflectors. And that makes heat go back out, or sorry, light go back out and not turn into heat. So if you have a change in this albedo coming from glaciers, then melting a little bit, and then finally now it's just water in the ocean, that's going to cause more heat to be absorbed and then more glaciers to, to melt and then more heat to absorb and more and then more and then more. That's what we're talking about with this positive feedback loop. And it's really important that you're able to explain it because almost certainly you'll get some kind of question about that on the exam. All right, so let's look at another multiple choice question. This is incoming and outgoing solar radiation on Earth. So based on the diagram, which of the following best predicts how an increase in greenhouse gases would affect the ocean? All right, looking good guys. So y'all are saying A, the oceans would be warm because of increased solar radi radiation being absorbed by the water and then causing expansion and sea level rise. So absolutely, if you're looking at this diagram, we're looking at increase of greenhouse gases. Here's the greenhouse gases, right? You got more, more coming in. It's being re-radiated back down. Um, and that's gonna definitely it uh, make the ocean warmer, and we know these are the two things we're, we're really worried about here. Okay. These are warm and cold surface currents in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. So based on the diagram, which of the following describes the most likely effect that glaciers melting in Greenland and in, in the Arctic would have on the surface currents of the North Atlantic? All right, so it looks like we're kind of split between um, B and C here. So let's kind of take a look at where we're um, where we are on the map. So that's the North Atlantic. So we're talking about this area right here. Okay. So warm current are our solid lines, and our cold cur currents are these little dotted lines here. So the Labrador current will be deflected by icebergs that break off. Sorry about that. Okay, so the Labrador current will be deflected by icebergs that break off from the glaciers. So it is true that when you have glaciation um, retreating or you have melting glaciers, you, you have these calving events where the big, you know, kind of sheets like break off into the ocean. Um, but typically what we're talking about here is the melting. So like what's happening to the fresh water as it flows into the ocean. So uh, let's look at see warm surface currents will become cooler and the cool oceanic currents will become water or sorry warmer. Um, and that's true. They, they will become cooler, but it's 
it's not, it's not going to help these become warmer because you've got really cold ice water melt. So if you look at it, D is actually kind of the best answer here. So this is the Norwegian current. This is what we're really worried about when we have um, melting of ice in Greenland and the Arctic. So as the, the fresh water melts, it's going to make the water cooler and also less salty. So I think that right here is kind of the key to that answer. All right, so let's talk about ocean warming and ocean acidification. What, where this really is an impact is for coral reefs. It's kind of a, um, a double whammy. So let's talk about ocean warming first. So I'm sure you've heard of a process called coral bleaching, where you have a really nice, healthy, um, pigmented coral that all of a sudden loses all of the pigmentation and it looks just like bleached out white kind of skeleton, right? Well, so what's happening here is that coral, although it's an animal, it does have this symbiotic relationship with algae. So you've got these little algal cells that symbiotically live within the tissues of the coral. But they're only sort of like tolerating them because they're in, a, you know, an optimal environment. Now, when the system is working, the coral kind of give them their little homes to live in, and the algae are helping the coral by providing them with food because, of course, they're photosynthetic. Now, when the coral gets stressed, though, they have a response where they purge all of these algae out of their tissues. So it's not necessarily um, at the moment killing the coral. It's causing those synthetic uh, symbiotic organisms to leave. And now when that happens, that makes them much more vulnerable to other types of things like disease, um, other types of algae establishing themselves on the tissue to where then they can't get the algae back in. And then if it is left bleached and they're no longer able to recover, that is when they can die. So if they don't, if they don't have the algae in their tissues, they're not getting the nutrients, they starve, they're no longer healthy, and then they could disappear. So when you know a coral has actually succumbed to coral bleaching is when they look like this. They're covered with like brown or green kind of slimy sludge and that's because they're no longer living. So that's caused by warming. As ocean temperatures increase, that stresses the coral. They purge those algae, they bleach, they become vulnerable to disease, and then they die. Now, the second thing that's a problem is the acidification. The acidification is not what causes the coral to look white. That's what causes the coral to not be able to maintain those intricate little skeletons that they make out of carbon. So when we look at this, uh, the first thing that you want to be able to do is Remember this equation, very rarely do I advocate for just pure memorization in this course, but here I absolutely do. If there's a few chemical equations that you wanna to commit to memory, it's this one, photosynthesis, cellular respiration, and then how do you make tropospheric ozone or photochemical smog? Those are the four, it's really, really important. So first, when you have an increase in CO2, okay? When that's absorbed by water, so seawater, the first thing that's, that's produced is carbonic acid. Now this actually happens in our blood as well, right? Because we have CO2 that's dissolved in our blood. That's why it's important to breathe it out. Well, once this carbonic acid is produced, it's gonna further dissociate, right? This is what produces more free hydrogen ions in the water and then these bicarbonate ions. Once you have an increase in hydrogen, it causes the pH of the ocean to drop, and then it keeps the uh, bicarbonate from being able to be absorbed by the coral. So it just kind of makes it that much harder for them to sequester enough carbonate for them to make up their calcium carbonate skeletons. So what is the problem here? Why do we care about corals being kind of in peril here? What ecological services do corals provide? And then how do we kind of benefit economically from them?
Excellent. Corals provide habitats for fish. Um, that's an ecological service because if we don't have fish habitats, well, then we have lower biodiversity. Um, they also provide, I think you, you guys are saying humans also benefit if you're a diver or if you like to go snorkeling. Um, that's a tourist attraction. We love to go and see, you know, beautiful coral reefs. So what I would do for sure is be able to identify some ecological services and then also economic benefits from corals. And that will help you kind of describe why it's important for us to, to save them or to, to mitigate this, the damage here. Okay, so we're going to shift here onto loss of um, biodiversity and species extinction. The reason why I want to show you these three terms is because oftentimes on, especially the free response, students will talk about a, a species going extinct when really they mean something like local extinction, where the species is gone from an area. So the population themselves are gone, but there's still some of the same species found elsewhere in the world. So I want you to be really careful because typically if you just say extinction, you know, we're going to read it like you, you mean there's none of them anywhere on earth ever. Um, so if you're going to talk about, well, the population is going to disappear, it's going to go extinct. Really what you're talking about is local extinction. So just make sure you're, you're kind of being clear about that. Now, before extinction occurs, you can have a decline in um, the species in general that can either cause them to be vulnerable or threatened, meaning generally they're still abundant, but because we can see there's a rapid decline in the numbers, they're likely to become endangered. Once we've got a species that is considered in danger, that means that so few individuals survive that the species could become extinct very soon everywhere. And right now we've got about 37,400 species that are threatened with extinction. And you can see here that, you know, amphibians are kind of um, the most threatened. 41% of them are actually listed as threatened, vulnerable, or endangered. So my next question to you guys, you know, why amphibians? Why do you think they're so threatened? Yeah, absolutely. Habitat loss is a big, big deal. A lot of our amphibian species live in um, rainforest, and those are undergoing the most rapid deforestation. All right, I think I think you're about to say um, climate climate change is really affecting them, um, and, and you're absolutely right. So there is a particular uh, threat to amphibians called, hopefully I'm spelling this correct, chytrid or chytridio my, uh, mycota, mycota. It's a fungus that infects their skin because um, you know amphibians are partly uh, semi-aquatic, so their skin is very moist and um, uh, susceptible to growth of fungus and it can somewhat kind of suffocate their suffocate them um, and pre prevent them from being able to exchange oxygen as much as they need. And because of climate change, chytrid has really been able to spread rapidly. So yes, you y'all are right, habitat loss, they're susceptible to pollutants in the environment because they do have an aquatic part of their lives, et cetera. Now, I told you about that acronym earlier, HIPCO or HIPPO plus C, however you want to say it. These are the, uh, this is the best way that you can kind of remember what are the important direct causes of extinction that biodiversity researchers know is happening. So H is habitat destruction, degradation, and fragmentation. I are invasive species or non-natives. P, that's our population. So this is, um, human population growth, and then our resource use. The other P is pollution, C is climate change, and then O is over exploitation. So this is like um, poaching, over harvesting, 
et cetera. All right, so habitat loss and habitat degradation, fragmentation is actually the greatest threat to wild species. So whereas we see some really compelling Im images of like pollution or, or other problems, it really is habitat loss that drives the majority of our species to go extinct. Um, this is due to destruction of wetlands, so draining them in order to build communities or turn it into agricultural land. Uh, deforestation, I mentioned tropical deforestation as being um, uh, extremely on the rise. And then uh, plowing of grasslands. This is due to a lot of reasons development of agricultural land, commercial development, um, even outdoor recreation like off-road vehicles can degrade environments, clearing tropical rainforest in order to have areas to graze livestock, and then of course the pollutants that occur because of this. Now I do want to differentiate habitat loss from habitat fragmentation. They're part of that same, you know, Ac acronym part, but it, is, it does look a little different. Habitat fragmentation is when you take a piece of land and you're kind of cutting it up into smaller and smaller pieces. So large continuous area of habitat, reduced, divided, scattered. Now, what kind of species are most at risk from fragmentation? Um, those that are rare and only found in certain locations, those that really need a large territory. So like I've got a tiger here, um, uh, wolves would be also another good example. They need to really be able to like move along or move in uh, a, variety, a variety of places, elephants, um, those that have a low reproductive capacity or specialized niches. Now, what does habitat fragmentation do that's a special concern? Well, it does make it easier for these patches to become uh, invaded by invasive species. It also exposes uh, individual animals or um, organisms to predators, disease. Storms and fires are, are more severe when you've got little patches of habitat. And it, it can kind of uh, reduce the amount of gene flow between populations because they physically can't get to each other. So this is a good example of a question that you might get about ha habitat fragmentation. So which of the following would be the most likely explanation for the changes shown in scenario three. All right, guys. So we're thinking we're thinking B, which does kind of you know sound like something that would happen. So roads and electrical power lines subdivided the landscape into smaller pieces and decreased the amount of available habitat. Okay, so that that is true. However, if you if you look how how big these um these issues are, so like that's a huge part of this like habitat. Um, I mean, they're taking out huge chunks here. So if it was something like a, a power lines or roads, you would maybe expect to have just like, like something that looks more like this, very small amounts. So interestingly enough, guys, the correct answer here um, is actually C. So the increased edge to interior ratio resulted in hab habitat fragmentation and the formation of smaller, more manageable parcels of land. So just to kind of review, you know, this is just, you're making um, small little uh, changes here. Here, you're completely taking away this habitat. Um, and, and this right here, this is more like uh, habitat fragmentation. 
All right. Last threat that I want to talk about for extinction is invasive species. So invasive, invasive species, I've kind of mentioned this before, tend to be generalist or selective species, meaning they can thrive in a variety of different ecological niches, they mature and they reproduce very quickly. And this allows them to really take hold in a new environment and outcompete native species for resources. So in order for an invasive species to pose a threat, not only do they have to be like taken someplace that they don't really belong, but they also have to be able to establish a population and really out compete the native species. Um, two that I want to kind of highlight here. Uh, I don't know if you guys have had a problem with these in your house, but I definitely have. Uh, they're really big pest, the brown marmorated stink bug. We don't really know how that got introduced. Um, but they have been exploding in their population. They like to get in your house when it's warm during the winter um, and they fly around and they, they are stink bugs and they're horrible. But one that is really impactful was Dutch elm disease. And that has actually reduced the elm population in the Northeast United States by 50%. Um, and so if you've ever seen uh, like them have to come through and like completely take like uh, take down elm trees is to try to help prevent the spread of these invasives. What you guys need to be able to do is talk about a strategy um, that we can use to control, eliminate, or prevent the spread of invasive species. So one of the things that we can do is identify what could potentially make an invasive species uh, successful and then maybe use some natural predators to control them. We can also do much better inspections of goods that are coming into our country to make sure that invasives aren't accidentally hitching a ride. If we also work internationally to pass laws and treaties that ban the sell and trade of certain species, that could help. And then we can also, for aquatic uh, invasives, require ships to discharge their ballast waters in the ocean and not doing in the in, in, in the port because that's kind of how we got zebra mussels was um, taking water from other parts of the ocean and then dumping it here uh, where they don't belong. Now there are some like personal things that you can do um, as far as like educating people on how to prevent invasive species. So if you got a question right like how do we stop the spread of an invasive microorganism? Of these strategies, what do you think would be best? Okay, yeah, this is perfect, guys. So do not take, you know, aquarium water and then completely dump them in waterways because there could be some microorganisms that you can't even see in there that can now get into our aquatic systems. Um, another thing that I saw you guys talk about is cleaning, cleaning your stuff after you go, you know, maybe across country on a mountain biking trip or a canoe trip, you could inadvertently be picking up microorganisms that are stowed away. You bring it, bring it back home. Then you go out into a national um, park or a state park, and then you're tracking those things into those areas. So yeah, I think those are excellent, excellent um, strategies for stopping microorganisms. So the reason why I wanted you guys to do this is because oftentimes on a free response, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, um, students are not specific enough to the problem. 
So if this had been different, if this had said, how do we prevent invasive plants from spreading? You would not be able to say, well, we need to clean our hiking shoes. Well, that's not what is actually spreading plants. What's doing that is when people do this, when they remove wild plants and, and bring them back, um, when they order plants from another country and then they come in and we plant them, right? So you wanna be very specific about uh, the strategy to the problem. All right, one more multiple choice here before we kind of wrap that part up. So cane toads are an invasive species that were actually intentionally introduced into Australia. So they're studying the effect of cane toads and they hypothesize that they negatively affect native species. So they use different locations with and without cane toads and that's what you see in the graph. So which of the following best interprets the results in the graph in relation to the given hypothesis? All right, guys, it looks like you got it. So if we look at this diagram here, we can see that the average number of uh, native species when toads are present are between 12 and 13, the highest around 14, the lowest are around 11. And in the absent area, there's this huge increase with no overlap of these bars, right? So it absolutely is true that cane toads negatively affect native species because there's greater biodiversity without the cane toads. Great job. All right, so the last thing I wanted um, to talk about for Unit 9 is the Endangered Species Act. So just like with Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, uh, Montreal Protocol, all of that stuff, you have to um, uh, know that the Endangered Species Act is also the same. So you cannot import or trade any product from an endangered or threatened species except for scientific purposes. And to be able or to be listed on uh, the Environment or Endangered Species Act, um, there has to be this decision making process. So it's really kind of complicated to get on this list. You, there's got to be a petition, it's scientifically reviewed, it takes about, you know, a year in order to get them on. Sometimes they're not even gotten, um, gotten on the list. And then afterward, you can designate a critical habitat that has to be protected, and then you have a recovery plan. So now this is a federal law. So this is um, applicable to the United States specifically. And there are some really great success stories. So gray whale has been delisted, the bald eagle, um, the black cap vireo, those have been saved because of actions with the ESA. The downside to this is um, you know, it's overseen, um, you know, and that, that kind of changes every year as to like how species get on the list, um, you know, how often are we actually enforcing the laws and enforcing these recovery plans, and there's still many, many, many endangered species that are not actually being protected. So it works when we, when we do it right, um, but it's just the problem is like getting them kind of on the list. All right, you guys, I want to talk about free response tips now, and then I've got a, a, a practice um, that we can look at. So if you remember, the free response section is going to be about 40% of your score. There will be three questions and they're 10 points a piece. The time you have for this section is 70 minutes and that averages out to be about 23 minutes per question. But that includes, you know, reading it, drafting out your answers, and then writing your response. Now the three question types you're going to have is the first one will be about designing an investigation. So that's kind of why I wanted to go over science practices with you guys today. Two is gonna be analyzing an environmental problem and then proposing a solution. And three is the same as two, except you got the math. Now, the first thing that I would say, my big, my big piece of advice 
is definitely to go to three first. So when you get your test, you know, you're reading through, kind of looking at what the, the topics are, what you think you're going to be able to answer um, well. And a lot of people just don't try to even do the math problem because they're like, oh, that's the math. I'm not even going to try to look at that. Well, that means that a lot of those end up blank. So when we read those every year during the summer, we'll get books where people didn't even try that question. So if you even attempt it and you get a few points, you're doing better than a lot of other students. And that's kind of the name of the game when it comes to your AP score. So I would, I would really consider doing three first because a lot of students don't even get to it and they don't even attempt the math. Now, if you're gonna do the math, please make sure that you show your work. So all of those like formula setups where you have your conversion factors and all of that, please make sure that you're um, showing us that. Also just make sure that you're using that answer document. Anything that's in your test booklet, we don't get. Um, those books don't go to the reading. Use that booklet to really brainstorm, but then you know answer on your document and then do try to you know, answer in complete sentences. Really the only time that like a one word answer works is if it's like an, an, an identify. So if it says like, identify the species that is going extinct and you say bald eagle, that would work. Okay, so the next kind of, kind of thing that I have for you guys are those task verbs. So in general, when you are asked to identify, boom, that's quick. It is the bald eagle done, period, the end, move on. Now, if you have to describe, discuss, or explain, that is going to require a more um, detailed explanation. So if you're just writing one little sentence, odds are that's not enough detail to fully get that point. Um, especially if you get a good conjunction there where you have to do two things. Oftentimes, we can't give you the identify point unless you also did the describe. So please check back and make sure that if you have an and, that you did both parts of the question. Now there's some new task verbs that you will see on the exam um, that I think potentially could give you some trouble here. One is make a claim and two is propose a solution. When it says to make a claim, I really wanna emphasize this. You have to look at something from the table, graph, uh, paragraph, text that you're going to use as evidence, okay? So oftentimes, like I think last Saturday, I gave you one about loggers and they're making a claim that if you uh, stopped clear cutting, they wouldn't be able to, you know, have, it would be a huge economic impact. Well, you had to pull evidence from that table to support a claim. The next is proposing a solution. This, again, really, really needs to be specific to the environmental problem. If you're talking about a place where people are living in extreme poverty or they're in a developing country, using things that are really only available in a developed country is not applicable, okay? So please make sure that you're, you are looking at the problem that they're giving you and, it's, and your solution's really appropriate to it. All right, let's talk about your pacing. If you don't know something and you have time, like this isn't like, oh, I didn't get time to get to it. This is like, well, I didn't put anything down because I didn't, I didn't really know. Put something down, put something down you think is even remotely related to the question. You never know. So if you've got time left over in that test and you've got blanks, go back and fill them in. Now, I will say, if you're given a specific um, instruction, like give two reasons or list a reason, we can only really grade the first two things that you say. So if you just start writing out a laundry list of potential correct answers and your eighth answer is actually the right one, I can only really give you points for the first two that you mentioned. So really try to put your best answer first. Um, this is really important, guys, and this is kind of why I have it bolded. The biggest time waster on this exam is restating questions or giving some type of like opening statement 
that isn't directly answering the question. It's really not necessary. You do not have to restate the question for the reader. We are literally just looking for your answer. So this is very different from maybe like an English essay or another type of AP class where you, you had to be a little bit more wordy. This is, this is a science course. If they say, describe photosynthesis, you do not have to start off by saying, well, to first describe photosynthesis, I would like to begin, you just start describing it. Well, this is when plants use sunlight energy to make organic materials. You know, like that's all you gotta do. This is a huge time waster, guys. So that can that's, that's gonna give you a lot more time if you can cut down on that. Now, like I said, you've got about 23 minutes per question. So don't spend 50 minutes on question one, especially if you're not confident about your answers. You know, remember you go back, try to, try to really distribute your time. Um, if you do look at the math part on question three and you're like, oh no, I'm not even, I don't even know how to start that. Don't just sit there and, you know, try to think about it. Be like, well, let me come back to that and I'll answer it last. Remember, you get a calculator. So don't be as intimidated about the math. Um, uh, it's not, it, it's probably not going to be as difficult as you think. Okay, so let's talk about formatting your answers before I let you practice a little bit. Never, ever give a super vague answer to a question. If you say something like, well, we shouldn't emit CO2 because it's bad for the environment. This never scores. If you say, well, we should reduce the amount of invasive species because they harm biodiversity, that'll never score. You have to say it's bad for the environment because it increases uh, a greenhouse gas, and that increases global climate change, right? It harms biodiversity because it, it takes resources from native species. Now, anybody can say pollution is bad. Like any high school student knows, well, we probably shouldn't have toxic chemicals poured in our waterways. What they're looking for is not any old high school student. They're looking for a high school student that took AP environmental science. So be specific, you know, name that chemical, really show the reader that you learned something in this course. Now, the, the last big thing I'm gonna say here, and, and I, I read these exams, so this is, this is super helpful. Please do not just write one big paragraph. We are always looking to give you points, and that job is made easier when you're really labeling your answers. So if you're answering part 1A, label your answer with that, even if it's not in order, because then we know, hey, that they're trying to answer that particular question. Because sometimes if you leave it ambiguous, we don't really know if it applies, and then we can't try to give you points for it. So if anything, you know, this is a super easy way to just make your answers easier to grade and increase the likelihood you get points. Okay, so enough of me talking about tips. Let's start with a practice question. So this one's about CO2 and oceans. So use the graph above to answer the following questions. Determine the concentration of CO2 recorded at uh, Mauna Loa in 2005, and then also determine the pH.
All right, guys, it looks like you've got your answers in. So let's check it out. So the response determines the concentration to be 380 parts per million, give or take about five. So at 2005, you know, we draw the line, it's about here, 375, it's kind of slightly above. But if you said 375, you got yourself a point. Um, pH was 8.08, .08, because again, the same thing right here, 8.08, .08, .08, give or take about 0 0.02. Um, both of you guys got that. So plus two points already. Okay, so this one's a little bit, a little bit more in depth. Let me get your slide going here. And I think this is probably gonna be our last thing we'll get to. So just answer as much as you can. And remember, you can be as brief as possible. Just answer the question in the simplest terms. All right, guys, I hate to cut you all off because you have about half of this answered, but it is 401 and I don't want to keep you too much longer after that. But it's looking like your first two answers are really, really good. So you're taking those tips at heart, kind of providing the most uh, briefest but most correct answers. So for the first thing where we are identifying or sorry, predicting the effect of increased CO2 on CO2 in the ocean. Ocean CO2 will increase. Dissolved oceanic CO2 will increase. Guys, that's it. That's all you had to say, right? As CO2 in the atmosphere increases, CO2 in the ocean will as well. Boom, you're done. The next one is the relationship between atmospheric CO2 and pH. As CO2 increases, pH decreases. Um, I think somebody said as CO2 or like lower levels of CO2, the higher the pH. Same thing, just you said it in the inverse way. For the next one, this is, this is the question why I want you guys to remember that chemical equation. This, this uh, question was on the exam a couple of years ago and I was surprised. I was like, oh no, I've never, I've never said that you need to, to memorize that equation, but you see it's here. Um, but it's not, it wasn't that difficult. You had CO2 plus H2O, that gives us H2CO3, that's carbonic acid. You could have even just done this where you've got the hydrogen ions and then the carbonate ions or just hydrogen and bicarbonate. So there was actually three ways that you could have gotten that. And then if you wanted to kind of skip down and not even tried this part, the identifying the specific environmental problem, 
that's just ocean acidification. That's all you kind of had to say, right? Because that one was um, identify. Well, ocean acidification. So I think very quickly within three or four minutes, you guys definitely had two or three points on this particular portion. All right, y'all, it is now 4.03. Um, good luck. I think that you guys will, will do great. Um, just study those things that you maybe didn't quite remember today or, or relook over your notes. I'm also happy to stay on if you've got a particular question that you want me to go over or any kind of like one of those FRQ tips. But other than that, you guys are free to go. Thank you for coming um, to our last study session.